Well, thank you for spending, uh, spending a little bit of lunch time with me. I know everybody's here for the talk and not the food. But uh, before I begin, uh, if anybody wants slides or follow-up questions, uh, you want to pass this around, just throw your email address on there, and I'll send everything out after the fact. Um, so where'd Lori go? Lori? Oh, I do have a pen. Yes. Let's do this guy. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, a quote about MIT. And as Laurie said, I'm a classical political philosophy dude. Uh, I uh, suck at math and suck at science, or did until I started doing this. And uh, it fascinates me how both are converging. And that's really the story we're going to talk about today, is where technology, where data, where people, where process are meeting to solve the problems of legislative data and law itself. So in 2011, uh, The Guardian wrote, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology has led the world into the future for more than 150 years with scientific innovations. Its brainwaves keep the US a superpower. But what makes the university such a fertile ground for brilliant ideas? Well, in my experience, my brief experience with, uh, with civic media here, uh, it's people like Ethan, it's people like Lori, people like Nicole, Andrew, I don't know if Andrew's around here. Uh, oh, hey Andrew, it's right here. And you guys, um, thank you for having me and being fabulous and being part of this MIT community. Um, where I come in is from the government side. Uh, everything, you, if you remember nothing else today, it's that the problems we face as citizens, as researchers, as journalists on the outside of government with technology and access are equal to and opposite the problems faced by people in government who have to do this stuff, who have to produce the information, who have to post things on the web. Um, and as we'll see, fixing the problems we have as citizens, getting from denied to open, is a process of helping both inside and outside of government. And this beautiful artwork here, I have to uh, credit to Alexis Ohanian. This is uh, a skewed version of his book cover uh, without their permission. Uh, that's part of the story we're going to talk about today, is we're getting from the denied to the open with law and legislation, uh, and sometimes without people's permission. And we'll discuss what that actually means for democracy today. Uh, so before I get too far, I want to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're the Open Gov Foundation, a uh, scrappy, nonpartisan nonprofit uh, working to bring the best tools and ideas from the tech world into government, where it's sorely needed. Uh, this is our GitHub page. If you want to fork us, my developers would love that. Uh, but that's where you can find all of our code for what we're talking about today. Um, we were born, actually, from inside Congress, as Lori mentioned. Uh, I worked for uh, Congressman Darrell Issa in the Oversight Committee in the US House. And we were born, actually, from a hack. So when the Stop Online Piracy started, that, that whole SOPA PIPA fight about a year and a half ago, uh, Daryl was the first guy in the house to raise his hand and say, you know, this shall not pass. Uh, but it was really late in the game. We were just as surprised as people on the outside. We didn't have the lobbyist money, we didn't have the support, and we didn't have the time. Uh, so what did we do? We walked into a room to try to hack the legislative process open with open source software. And that was our first tool called Madison, uh, which is what instigated the OpenGov Foundation. So Madison, I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. It was essentially a uh, crowdsourced legislative tool we used to diagnose problems with SOPA, so to get all the expertise, much of which is in this room, into the process and also deliver an alternative the right way, collaboratively, on the internet, accountably, where everyone can weigh in and participate. This is what Madison looked like at the time. You can see it's uh, pretty stripped down, simple, but it opened up the legislative data giving people a way to annotate, comment, ask questions, discuss, do something with that information. This is legislative process on the internet. It's ugly, but it worked. So the problems we're all facing in government are pretty maddening. Um, just yesterday, uh, a certain other Cambridge-based university that also likes Crimson uh, released a study, a pretty sobering one, that says more than, that more than 75%, oh, excuse me, yeah, more than 75% of young Americans are disengaged. And they don't care to become engaged. But you guys are engaged. 
and you're engaged in a really high-tech way. With the hacker ethos alive and well, and you guys here can convene these two people. This is my co-founder, Congressman Issa, and Ethan talking uh, at the Civic Media Night Conference last year. Uh, you guys are bringing together uh, left and right, science and civics. Uh, that's what this discussion and that's what these problems all revolve around. And you, more than most people, know what's at stake. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Aaron Schwartz. Uh, the, uh, the legal issues that he was facing, um, they're real. This is an academic. The, the things we're going to talk about today, the problems of access, of equal protection of the law, of the ability to participate, uh, are far more than academic. It's real life. People go to jail, or worse, for putting this information on the internet. So what? You guys know technology. Well, it's all about people. So the technology only serves what we're trying to do here as, as a society. It means nothing if it isn't helping everyday people secure their rights in this country and protect themselves from the powerful and hold government accountable. Whether the powerful is a corporation or government, all we're doing is strengthening citizens' right to participate, access information, and secure equal protection. Now, everybody knows America is supposed to deliver the freedom to participate, the freedom to share ideas, the freedom to speak freely, assemble, petition your government. All of that depends on information and communicating it. You cannot act unless you know. And our founding fathers knew that. They knew that everybody had to have the ability to access what government was doing if they were going to be able to participate in it and hold it accountable. Now, back in the day, the best that they had were horses and parchment paper. That was access to the law. Or if you could find your congressman and pigeonhole him at, at some uh, public house, that was about the best you could do. James Madison was right. The only guardian of true liberty in the United States is the advancement and diffusion of knowledge. Now, what does that mean today? It means taking the Constitution or law and legislation that essentially still exists in a format not a whole lot better than this, if it exists on the internet at all, and get it to this. And that's the story that we're, we're going to talk about today. Because if you don't have access to it, you can't be a citizen. Now think about that for a second. You cannot be a full-fledged citizen unless you are enjoying unfettered, restriction at restricted restriction-free access to the stuff of government, which is the words and the people who enforce those words. Our founders, frankly, would be horrified if they looked at this room, this building, all the whiz-bang awesome stuff going on in here, and then looked at what government is doing. That's just not good enough. Paper, PDFs, and copyright restrictions. That's what we're dealing with. Those are the problems that we're facing today in the context of the law. So I would propose to you that the law is the most important data set in any community. If you think about it, everything else flows from there. Now, who, who works with civic data on a daily basis? Anybody? Reporter? You're, you're a reporter. What do, you, what do you access for government information? Not a lot? OK. Does anybody work with uh, spending information, transit information? How would, you, how would you find some spending information to that? Cambridge Brothers is a big PDF file, which is only, right, it's printed paper scanned in. So you're still back at the parchment. OK. So it's a little bit better, but it's still not there. Right. So there's a technology aspect to that, and then there's a process aspect to that. There's also a people aspect to that. Now, unfortunately, we cannot fork uh, the human soul and, uh, and change the human condition. So we'll be talking about, or I'll be talking about the tech, 
and the process side of it. Let's begin with how people are doing it today. If you're a citizen, you want to know the leash laws. What do you do? You. What would you do? Yeah, if you wanted to find out what, what the dog leash laws were, what would you do? Well, look at it's not uh, how, how do I find the law? Probably Google it, right? That's almost everybody's first step in first research assistant. A hundred lawyers. Yeah. yeah, it's very different. A hundred lying lawyers. <laughs> You'd probably Google it if you're a citizen. And if, as we all know, if it doesn't show up on the first page, it ain't there sometimes. Any developers in the house? Developers, coders, you're a developer? How do you access the legal, how would you access the information? Yeah, I wanted to find out what the city council's um, salary was because it's too, high, it's too high. And I was talking about that. And it's impossible to find. So I'm Googling it, I'm surfing the back channels of the so if you're a developer or a citizen, well, you're a citizen developer and elected official. By the way, who just said he gets paid too much? I think uh, this might be the first time in history. <laughs> if you go to the law, this is the Massachusetts, the laws of our, of our state. No APIs, no bulk download, can't access it. What if you're a lawyer or a legal support uh, person? You're trying to do your job and serve clients. You've got to go through all this paper, and you're not actually able to serve as many people as you want. Those are our first users, by the way, are people who just want to serve more clients who can't afford legal assistance. They want to be able to send a link. That's crazy, a link to the law that's applicable. They can't do that today. If you're a state lawmaker, the first thing that you do when a new issue comes up is you see what everybody else has been doing. You want to see, hey, I'm in Massachusetts. What did they do in Maryland? What did they do in California? But you can't do that because all the laws aren't in the same format and often aren't in the same place. If you're a city official looking to figure out if your enforcement is working, you want to be able to see, hey, where's the hot spots? Who is breaking the law where and where do we need work? You can't do that today. If you're an academic researcher, by the way, this is MIT students back in 1957 doing research, um, very different than today. Um, you can't find it online. Same thing with journalists, same thing with business owners. Business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, they're hit with far more law than most of us are. Everything you see in this picture has a technical code. Grab your chair, that thing you are sitting on is covered by dozens and dozens and dozens of technical codes. Where do you find those? Most of them are not on the internet, or if they are, they're copyrighted and you could be put in jail or worse for trying to access them just to do your job. So all the problems we've been discussing here as far as accessing the law and legislation involve discoverability problems, jargon, expertise, you don't know what the words say, cost and time and money, design problems, data formatting. It seems daunting, right? There's a lot of stuff that's wrong here with the way that government information, particularly law and legislation, is accessible today. But we got it. We can do this. Everybody in this room has a skill that's applicable to solving this problem. So what I'm going to turn to next is how this stuff is actually made. So this is where the government side of my background comes into play a little bit. Um, understanding how this stuff is actually produced by the folks inside of municipal, state, and federal governments is absolutely vital to figuring out how to solve it. All right, Schoolhouse Rocks. Who remembers this stuff? How is a bill made? Well, what is the bill? What is the law? It's actually not what you would think. Most of us think the law or legislation is this, right? You've got a section, you've got words on a page. This is, uh, I think these are one of the gambling ordinances. I know it's been a hot topic up here recently. But this is it. It's actually not this. This is just a snapshot of whatever the law happens to be right now. 
Every word on this page, every sentence, is actually a mosaic. It's the sum total of all of the changes made to that law since the state started, or since the country started, or since the Magna Carta was signed, whatever the first document is, that original program, each word is the sum total of all of these little pictures. All right, so now that we know what the law actually is, it is the sum total of all the little changes, all the little forks made over history to what is the source code of the community. So that's the, that's the sort of template that I like to use to explain it to myself. This is the source code. Just like any program needs that to run, any community needs the law or it can't function. So how is it made? Where does it start? It starts with a problem. Now the problem I'd like to use today is gambling, right? The problem, uh, let's say you, uh, you don't have convenient enough casino options, you can't go to Foxwoods, can't go to wherever. Uh, my grandmother used to go to Foxwoods all the time. So Massachusetts had a real world problem. There are not enough casinos in Massachusetts. The first thing that you do when there is that real world problem is you've got to figure out where the law is applicable. Where in that massive hundreds of pages of PDFs is gambling referred to? I just did a quick search on the page. This is only one of four, but these are many, 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 many places. So you have to identify where those are. This is what it looks like in the mosaic sense. Now if you remember, the people who are doing this have the same crappy technology and tools that we do. So they have to do that massive process, often by hand. And they need a hell of a lot of help. Boston can't do it by itself. America can't do it by itself. So they hire who? They hire outside vendors who do this for a living. Vendors like American Legal, LexisNexis, Westlaw are hired by almost every, or at least in my experience, every state, city, county, federal government to simply help them produce the law, uh, to know where that one word has been referenced over time, how that one word has evolved over time, to marshal all of that information that a legislator would need to write a bill to fix that problem. Then the legislators do their thing. Uh, we're all familiar with, uh, with how that happens. And then it goes back to the people who produce the law. So it goes back to the clerks and it goes back to the vendors. This is a simple compiler, but that's exactly what they're doing. They are compiling all of those little changes to the law that happens in a bill and getting it into the right format so that it fits in this. It's translating a bill to the code. That's called codification. All right, keynote. There we go. So they compile it into the law itself. And how are they doing that? Well, they're doing it with the same tools, as I've said over and over, that we're faced with on the outside. They're doing it in PDFs. They're doing it in Word. They're doing it on crappy, outdated technology with procurement rules all on top of it. Fixing this requires this. And this is the hardest thing I've found and we've found in our experience to actually own and mean is you got to have a little sympathy for the devil. Government sucks. The law sucks online today. The ability to access it sucks. you got to have sympathy for the people who are doing it. They're citizens too. And they want to do their jobs better in most cases. We're assuming the best. So fixing it requires a little bit of sympathy for the devil. They're doing it in paper. They're doing it with an army of lawyers. This is Atticus Finch. They're actually doing it with a lot of them. In Chicago alone, there are 17 lawyers from vendors who keep the code updated and publish it four times a year. You need those people to do all, the, all that work. And it's expensive. States and cities are paying hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a year, a, a year to keep this document updated. It's essentially my, a track changes operation. You need, you need all that people to do it? Well, you need most of them. You need that old domain expertise. You need to know how to translate a bill 
into code, into the law. That takes money, that takes time, and that's where we come in. So now I get to talk about the technology. The state, state decoded. Has anybody heard of the state decoded? Checked it out? What do you know about it? I was working at the mayor's office when we were putting this thing together um, in San Francisco. I mean. um, oh, crap. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, the state decoded is, is just a way to put your code online. Um, it's a really nice template for doing so. Put some great people put together. There we go. And uh, it's super easy to use and very useful. State decoded, ta-da. So all of the problems that we were talking about before, the tech and the process, not the people, we're trying to address here. Now this started, this whole open source project started in Virginia uh, with a genius civic hacker named Waldo Jaquith. Uh, he was frustrated, just like we were, at his inability to get the laws for his own state. So he said, you know, screw it, I'm doing it. Embrace that hacker ethos and started building this for Virginia. Uh, the Knight Foundation, um, who generously funds us, generously funds the Civic Media Center and also funded Waldo, um, took it up to a level where we could come in and start scaling it. So Waldo did Virginia, now we're taking it to cities and states around the country. So this is the, the beautiful front end and the end result for accessing the law. Where does it start? So how does this actually happen? Well, we start with the code. Could be in a PDF, could be in a text file, could be in an RTF. You have to start with the data that they're giving us. Middle steps, PDFs, RTFs, TXT files. Then we parse that into XML. Boom, decoded law. Crazy things like the ability to send a link, the ability to search, the ability to plug into an API in bulk downloads, the ability to update almost instantaneously. All of the things that we know we need to be full citizens today, given all the technology and the tools we have, that's what we're working on here. And it's starting to spread a little bit. Starting in Virginia, Sunshine Statutes is Florida, Maryland, Baltimore, San Francisco, Philly, Chicago. These are the ones in process. We've got about 15,000 left to go because our goal is to get the entire corpus of law in the United States into the same open data format on the internet without any restrictions that you can do anything you want with. So that's producing open law and legislation in the 21st century. I wanted to give you a quick overview of the, the production problems, which you may or may not have been familiar with because that explains why it sucks so much on the outside and give you a little bit of look at the technology that we're using uh, to change that. And we're changing it from the outside. Sometimes governments like San Francisco hire us uh, to do that. Sometimes they say, give it, we'll give you the data. We don't know what the hell you're going to do with it, but it's public information. Go for it. Um, sometimes you, it's scraped with all the legal implications that that has. Um, that's what we're doing today. So I'd like to, I guess, open it up for questions. Uh, see where we go next. Uh, yeah, I'm Ian Condry. I'm here in the Perry D Studies and Civic Media. Um, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm sure it's a good idea. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with the language that uh, law is the source code of society. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I'm a little worried about the idea that once there's transparency, then that sort of then that equals access, or, or that mm -hmm. equals sort of uh, everyone then has a similar ability to take advantage of the law. I mean, I think copyright is a perfect example of how uh, suing, you know, rich Hollywood studios suing college students is completely unfair uh, dynamic, and even though the college student is right, to, to win the case would cost a quarter of a million dollars right. or whatever. And, and I, I was thinking of your slide there where it's, it's the woman in the legal aid office, yeah. you know, trying to explain the law. I mean, you can send the link to that guy and be like, well, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And so I guess I'm curious, uh, and maybe it's beyond your purview and you can't do everything I realize, but I'm curious to what extent there's thinking about that connection between law and community action or the things that the community needs. I, mean, I also I disagree with the idea that, you know, 
the casino law starts with a, a problem of not accessing casino. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's a little too short a history there yeah. of, of what's, and, and even really lacks, it, it sounds a little naive in terms of what a casino does to a community too, right? I mean, that's the other thing is that, so, so I guess that's my question is, is to what extent is this project thinking about how to actually enable people who aren't expensive law firms and aren't well-connected lobbyists and legislators to be able to make use of this stuff, you know? And, and it seems to me that there's some of these laws are gonna be real helpful uh, to some people. Um, and a lot of them, they're just, they're not about us, you know? They're not about our daily life. Uh, and, and so is that kind of, that, and I, I think it was kind of social API, <laughs> right? It's not computer to computer, but it's like how do you connect uh, law to, to what uh, society actually needs. And, and that, I think that's part of the frustration about government, not just that it's, it's not searchable, but that even if it is, it doesn't really seem to be tackling the problems around us. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering, do, do you think about that at all, or, or is there a, or integrating with some other kinds of groups to do that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first off, next time I use a better example. Um, <laughs> what I was trying to get across there is that, how does it start? Right? No one introduces a bill for no reason. No one tries to change the law for no reason. They need something to start it, and it's something in real life. Uh, yeah, but people would say, so I, that's what I was thinking too. You say, well, why do we have a law saying don't kill people? Right. Well, people, before there were laws, people knew it was a bad idea to kill people, it seems to me. And that's true of a lot of laws. And it seems to me even a lot of sort of, it always occurs to me that the, the politicians are almost the last ones to get it. You know, that there's a sort of, tends yeah. to be a sea change in society and culture, and then it catches up, uh, and then it's the battle of who's got power in society, and copyright's a personal example of that distortion uh, of the power of corporations over what everyday people would actually think is fair for copyright. So, so anyway, yeah. To, to, your, to your question about you know, what, what are you doing to get this to the people that need it, mm -hmm. um, that's about how, where we spend half of our time. So getting all of the data up to a place where you can actually do something with it and figure out how it matters to you, how it matters to you, what you're using it for, what a business is using it for, what a legislator is using it for. Those are the use cases that I spelled out there. Um, and at risk of droning on too long, I didn't go into the, the ways that that connect on the other side. Um, that's the research we're doing now. And those are the users that we're connecting to and building around with. So our, our workflow is sort of responsive. So we get it up to a level. We get it out into the hands of users. It's kind of the, the lean, lean startup methodology, I guess. And then see what comes back and build around that. And as I said, the first users uh, in most of the cities that we've released this in are the people that just need volume. They need technology to, to make their jobs more efficient so that they can serve more people or serve the same number of clients with less time and headaches. Um, I have no idea where that's going to go. Um, that's the bleeding edge. I mean, we're, we're covered in blood there. Just because up to today, you have not been able to do that. No one was walking around with this, saying, what part of this do you like? What part of this do you need? Um, now we can do that on the internet in a way that you can actually measure and track and then respond and build around. Um, if we have this conversation this time next year, that's what I want to be talking about. You? Yeah, so it's a related question about how do you, are you going to do, repre, represent and visualize the laws? And how do you think about that? And what about the open, the annotation framework, something like that? Mm -hmm. yeah, or command system, or social interaction? Uh, visualization is super powerful. And it's, uh, it's something that is built in, in a very small sense. We just have sort of word cloud type uh, type visualizations built in. Um, as we get more and more legal codes up, the possibilities for visualizations and comparisons get a lot bigger. Uh, that's the use case for a, a legislator on the state and municipal level. What are the guys next door doing? How did that work? What are, what's the state next door doing? How did that work? Um, that's what, what can be powered by this. Uh, we're not there yet. And as far as the production side, so half of us, I started off saying why we were born uh, with this Madison tool. Um, Madison is going to sit on top of this. 
and allow you to actually draft legislation or edit, create legislation on top of the legal code to make that whole process more seamless. So we're cutting out a lot of the steps here um, just with the state decoded um, to get the law from zero to 60 or updated. Well, then how do you, the next step is the process by which that is made. Um, Madison 2.0 is, is under development right now. Uh, you can check it out on our, on our GitHub page. Um, we're going to do Maryland in January, the state of Maryland. And then we're doing the federal government at the end of January, early February. Um, but we have our 1.1 versions up now if you want to check them out. It's uh, maryland.opengovfoundation.org and madison.opengovfoundation.org. It's stripped down bare bones, but you'll get a sense of it. Is it fair to say that at the federal and state level that this is mainly useful and we're aimed at legislative just leaders or people that work for them? Um, I think particularly at the federal level, uh, incredibly complex law of the Affordable Care Act or something about Frank. I can't imagine the person being engaged with those laws, or just, you know, someone outside of government being engaged with those laws um, just because they're plain tax or things like that. Definitely when it comes to like, uh, these laws, I can see that that would be very helpful. Because otherwise, I'm going to have a hard time to see what other people are doing, I'm assuming what they're doing with the law. Um, so being able to search that really clearly at the county level is helpful. But, but, but for this, at the, at the top level of the um, who do you think is going to be the most useful? The most use of the law of Madison or State Dakota? Uh, either one. Like, who are you, who's your audience, I guess? The, if they're going to be doing user testing, who are you going to be testing? Uh, broadly, we define our user testing as a group on the inside of government mirrored by a group on the outside. So in the federal example, let's say staff assistants or legislative councils or legislative directors, people who actually have to write the bills, who have to listen to constituent feedback, who have to listen to lobbyists, who have to listen to the news, um, all boiling that down into what they actually drop in a box and vote on. Um, that's outrageously inefficient. And that was what we started to hack with Madison. But it's bringing all of that input in to make it more useful and satisfying to both people on the, the phone line, so to speak, or on the web page. Um, we built Madison so we could get folks like you to share what is wrong with SOPA in a way that we could actually make use of. So people were tweeting at us, people were sending emails, people were calling. All of that is divorced from the actual bill itself, the actual work that we're doing. And the people that are doing that work have their nose on a bill, not on the, the line with the constituents. So it's bringing that input, tagging it on the bill. Um, that makes the whole process far more satisfactory to those on the outside. Um, so something I didn't talk about yet uh, is our user research. It's not just laptops, how do you, you know, UI, UX research. It's how do you present this? How do you introduce this to people? What do they actually want? Um, they're not satisfied with what they get today, but what they're not satisfied is they feel when they call that that means nothing, or that you send an email and no one reads it. Okay, those are technology things we can solve, if you're a congressman and you're reading down comments on a bill or a staff member is and you open it, you can send that constituent an automatic read receipt, which nine times out of ten is all that person wants, just to know that it was read by somebody. Those are, that's, so that's where the technology problem sort of starts to get up to the people problem. And we're never going to solve the people problem unless you know, the good Lord comes down again and says, woof, open everything. Um, but what can we strip away on the technology side to make to make that work? I'm going to follow up on both Andrew and Ian's questions, so translated through a framework that looks a little bit different. Um, this question about so the goal is to open as much of this information and data to as many people as possible. And so it's half the goal. Half the goal. And so part of that is about okay, so if we make this available in formats that are possible, open APIs, can access the goal and stuff around it. Um, we'll give an example of a transit, right? So as, as more and more cities start to open you know, transit data, you have lots of private developers making apps, mm -hmm. free and paid, to give you access to that data in different formats. Many, and many times the best apps end up being sort of, you know, paid apps. Right? This is a very small sort of daily life example, but to ask a much larger question, which is, I, I want to push you to think a little bit more about 
uh, the possibility of um, if you don't put certain safeguards in place. Right? So, for example, as people build web services and open them and allow people to build on top of them, that's why we have the AGPL. Mm -hmm. right? So we're saying, well, we're making things open, but in many cases, what ends up happening is the best implementation comes along as a private service that's paid, and right, right there, you start cutting out, uh, you know, it's class, right? So by opening data, we are paradoxically uh, making it more available to people who already have more resources. And so the question is, are there either social or technical or legal constraints that we might put on our open systems that would ensure that they remain open and accessible to as many people as possible? That's are a, you having that debate? That's a fantastic question. Um, are we having that debate? I would, are we, you know, are, Partners in Crime and sort of our, our foundation, uh, I don't think we are in that, uh, here I'll pull up here, <laughs> our disclaimer. Let's see, this is, we got at the bottom. Um, all, all content is of course owned by its authors, the municipal code charter and all rules on this website are owned by the citizens of San Francisco and con consequently they are not governed by copyright, so do whatever you want with it. The information on this website does not cons constitute legal device. It's all open. Do whatever you want with it, whether that's paid or unpaid. Um, it's a thorny question. Um, we try to go as far as we can to ensure that this is open and available to everybody. That's why there's an application layer on top of that data stream that we're trying to make more and more and more and more useful. And that's where I think where Walda started this was to get at that exact question. You know, if you've ever tried to act, when government says your city, your state, your federal government, hey, bulk data, we've, we've opened data, here you go, um, it doesn't mean anything. It's useless without an application layer, and what they give you is a government website with all of the problems of design and process that we've discussed. Um, how does that get better? Um, part of it is what we're doing. Part of it is what you're doing. But I think part of it is coming from paid services. Um, you know, that's, that's a big debate that's starting to rage within the open government community. I'm sure you've, you've heard some of it. Um, it sort of feels weird to sell some of this stuff or to be, you know, in a free world and then actually want to go make a business out of it. Um, that's how innovation happens in a lot of ways. Um, how can we benefit from that without closing people off? Um, that's secondarily why we're embracing open source software. So that when some good idea comes into us, or we come up with a good idea, it's available to everybody to build off and modify. I know that might that probably hasn't answered your question totally, but I don't think you can ensure that there's nobody uh, walling off access completely at some point down the production pipeline or the, the access pipeline. Well, I'm, I'm not going to argue against paid services, but if we did want to do that, there would be very simple uh, legal ways to do that. So you would say, uh, this is available under conditions that what's done with it is an paid service. So I'm not saying you should do that. I'm saying it's a debate worth having. Yeah, it is a debate. It is a debate worth having, um, and it's a debate that's very much underway right now. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I a broader question. Um, one sort of narrative for the rise of open government would be, uh, you know, pressure from, from groups um, like your foundation and others. Other would be technologies that, that make this sort of openness more possible. Um, and I don't want to count either of those, and, and you know, certainly some of the work I did in San Francisco plays into both. Um, I just want to bring up another narrative, which I'm seeing mostly in the UK right now, but I'd be interested to know if you've seen examples of it in the US, which is openness essentially coming as a result of decline. So okay. two municipal governments, uh, one, uh, Barnet in London, uh, famously last year published the graph of doom, in which they essentially projected how they were not going to be able to provide any services other than urgent adult care and child care after, I think it was 2015. Um, and as a result, Barnett, um, having been a big advocate of outsourcing of government services, uh, started talking about open government in a very radical way, saying, well, because we have no money, then we need to get people involved. Um, and just last week, I noticed that Solly Hull, which is in the West Midlands in, in England, talked about switching to a social council model, is what it's called, which again was a kind of radical openness, getting citizens involved. But again, it was coming from this position of weakness. So because we have no money, and because government is essentially in decline, that's why we should be open. 
I'm just curious as to whether you see much evidence of that in the in the U.S. and whether openness coming from this perceived position of weakness kind of affects the openness that we get. I think you are seeing that in the U.S. It's the world that government lives in today, and government people live in today. Um, it's when I was talking about sympathy for the devil, um, I can I can swear up and down that the the folks who are doing this wish they had a little bit more money to do it better. Um, they don't. They're doing having to do more with less, um, and they don't know what to, what more to be doing with that less or that less money, if that makes sense. Um, that's where we come in, frankly. That's why this exists. That's why this is a thing. If our success for us is kicking the keys over to San Francisco, kicking the keys to the federal government, kicking the keys, you know, Madison goes to the House of Representatives. That's what they should be doing, but they can't. Um, okay, there are two ways to address that, right? Oh, let's suck it up for a little bit longer, or can we hack something ourselves and then just put it out there and maybe give it to government, maybe sell it to government, maybe give it to citizens or sell it to citizens? Um, I don't think it, it negatively impacts uh, the success of those endeavors. I actually think it helps them. Um, if someone comes to you and say, I, I can't solve this myself, it's a very humbling experience. And to have government or elected officials actually go to you and say, I don't know a whole lot about online piracy. Can you help me write this bill? I don't know a lot about the ITC or international copyright law. I know some. I know enough to get a framework of what I want to do down and work with those vendors to figure out where it's addressed in the US code. But I don't know the right solution. That's why you hold, you know, in the analog world, hearings with witnesses to bring in all that knowledge and that expertise to help government do its job. That's not good enough anymore uh, because you have four people at a witness table. With the internet, you can extend that witness table infinitely in both directions. And I think that more people are, at the outset, willing to come and sit at that infinite witness table, whether it's through Madison or State Decoded or any other tool, if government or their elected officials take that humbling, and I hope not humiliating, first step of raising their hand and saying, I can't do this, and I don't know. Would it be useful to, um, I mean, thanks for the, for the presentation, and I'm really interested in this. I'm working with the, World Wide Web Consortium, which is enhancing or trying to lead the web to its full potential. This is clearly a spot where it does not yet happen the way uh, it could be. Um, but wouldn't it be useful to uh, link it to actual cases, like to, to, to situation where you had um, questions of whether the law is applicable or not? Because what you actually want is that people can access, let's say, a database or your, your application and then, for example, they asking about, do I have to leash the dog or not? I would have probably asked someone who has a dog, because I assume that he already informed himself about what's right and what's wrong. Right. So, but that's two clicks away from where I want to be. Right. right. And um, while you want to enhance the law as a citizen of the state, right. you want to know if this law is still I mean, appropriate to, to my current situation of it's made some hundred years ago and nobody asks it. So, no? Exactly. Actually, no one is following that. Yes. The least wise is it. Because um, that's what you want to know when you elect your, your, your people, your, your court and everything. Um, you want to make them enhance the law. But unless you don't know, you cannot choose on the right people. Well, so that's so this is something that I clearly see in your movement. Is what, is what? Like the, the creating um, openness, transparency. Yeah, I think, I think what you're thinking about is sort of the next step. Mm. Um, because you're talking about, first of all, a lot of these things in their own, in the words that they're written in aren't available. But you're saying, um, how can people find all the different things that these, uh, that these relate to? And the situations, you know, there would be some way to index that information. But I think that Getting it up there, if it's not even, if it's not even, I mean, I was, I was thinking too about your, um, I'm just really interested about this source code analogy, or whatever you want to call it, and how you incorporate 
you know, whether that letter extends to all the common law, that is, the cases that interpret the mm -hmm. laws. I mean, I realize, again, that's off in the future. You're, you're dealing with something that's not even up there at all in a lot of states. Um, but that would be sort of similar, you know, beyond the letter of the law, where does it apply? And how has it been applied? Mm -hmm. You know, and is it one of those laws that people just don't pay any attention to? Like, uh, I like, like this idea of, of, of an index, maybe. If people could add their yeah. current situation or their case um, to what is written in the law, you can create a landscape of, let's say, the thousand articles that are being use, used mostly during all day life, and then maybe how two or three more articles are linked to each other. And then you can see, okay, this is something that is really uh, useful for people, so we have to we have to work on that. And then maybe there's something that is, won't be used like in 100 years. So an index <coughs> would be the right thing, or the first thing. These are court decisions. Here, um, this is Virginia. This is Waldo's, sort of the the first and the the most mature. Um, is that in the code the application that um, you were talking about using San Francisco in the municipal code? Does it does it have a feature where you can put in a link or a mention of court decisions? It does. We haven't put the data in yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's that's next for us in all of those instances. Yeah. Um, you know, we're we're facing the issue of scale. Uh, with, with a hearty band of developers, and as far as getting all of the data formats, I mean, just getting the actual data. It's sometimes a work of weeks, months, all that stuff, yeah. But you're right, the court decisions are applicable. It's built to hold legislation, right? It's built to hold regulation. All of that is revolving around, whether it's changing or interpreting this, the actual law itself. Um, Well, yeah, and, it, and it, the, the beauty of the framework, though, and the growing feature list is if you just get that data and get it to the right format the first time, then you unlock the possibilities, which makes it a hell of a lot easier to get it the second time and the third time, and that's the kicking of the keys over to government eventually, um, where they say, wow, this is ridiculously useful and way better than what we have. Uh, we don't have to spend a million dollars on LexisNexis every year. Maybe we only have to spend 50 and the rest of it we can do ourselves or with civil society help. Um, exactly. Yeah, well, and that, that, that was the point I was trying to make, is that the, the stuff we face is mirrored on the inside um, in every case. Now, as far as changing it, to, to your original question, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Felix. Um, to your question about the, the um, inline sort of editability or responding to it um, as you're using it, that's here. So to not blow people's minds, a comment on the bottom is a lot more familiar and comfortable to the, most of the folks that we're dealing with on the inside um, than Madison is. The notion you can edit everything, comment on everything, uh, track changes on everything, and then make it all go away because you're not actually changing that underlying text is very hard to get across unless you see it. So we start with the comments. And we've already got one um, that's being changed. And you're the first people outside of, uh, of the government to see this, and it's, it's uh, a draft piece of legislation out of San Francisco. Um, so somebody came onto the San Francisco website to look up sanfranciscocode.org just to find what the rules on bikes were, and they found something that legislators missed. It was out of date, but it was buried in the housing code. If you own an apartment or own a house in San Francisco with a parking spot, you are only allowed under current law to park a motor vehicle there. You can't park your bike in your parking space. That's crazy. And someone said something to that effect, like, this is dumb, this is stupid, can't we do something about this? That's very easy once it's identified, but no, one's go no one has the ability to sort through all that crap. You know, this, what, one of the things I want to do with this first lighthouse program of cities is just do a dumb law cleanup. And that's something anybody can do, right? We've been on the internet, 
all the dumb laws in Boston, many of which you know, can be apocryphal, like, oh, you can't shoot a whale from a driving car in Michigan. Um, well, there are things like that. And they're not supposed to be in there. And people actually can get ticketed or worse if you break those laws. And oftentimes, the first time you find out about it is when you get the cuffs or the ticket. Um, OK, when you're looking that stuff up, it's a very, very small step and a familiar one to say, what the heck? Can we do something about this? And what we're finding is that when you just do that flag it, flag of it, people will do something about yeah, it. Yeah, technology can do that. It's very, that's exactly. a very, exactly, that's the point. Nothing you have to pay people, all you have to people. So that was in, that was, you've, you've struck upon the way, um, you know, the technology part actually here is not that hard. It's the, the process part, which is really, really, really hard and sticky. Okay. Uh, well, there, there's a lot of sticky wickets there, uh, to put it lightly. Um, throughout what you just described, though, there are a number of, of things that are technology and process that can be made more efficient, more discoverable, more useful. Uh, the advocacy part, whether it's right or wrong to send an ethanol train this here, or whether it's right or wrong for the governor to be able to do whatever he wants and all that jazz, um, that's the people side of it. But how can we arm those people, whether it's citizens, environmental activists, the governor, the state legislators, everybody, reporters like you, how can we arm them to be talking about 
that, the environmental regulation, whether or not it fits Massachusetts and, its, and the state's needs today, uh, instead of arguing about how stupid it is that the governor um, can find something in a bill that I can't as a reporter, or the army of lawyers is on one side and I don't have one. Um, that's really what I think we can achieve, is leveling that playing field. So Waldo has a great term where he talks about the state decoded. It's got all the niceties of modern website design and the expensive tools that lawyers use. Um, that's really what this is. It's, it's giving you the same ability to search, discover, and actually find out what the hell the problem is that the governor does, or that LexisNexis does, or that those environmental activists who spend all day on a little section have. The Madison side of it and the annotation side of it is gathering all of that feedback in a useful format. So an environmental group is saying, call your congressman and tell him, vote no on the train, the ethanol train through my neighborhood act. Um, that's made ridiculously useful if they can just go onto the bill itself and say, I like this or I don't, or fix this or ignore that, this is good. What you're describing there, like Obamacare is like the thing I always use in my head. I would have given a kidney to have tools like this on that bill because the, not, the dirty secret is that both parties agreed on the vast majority of the bill. You know, I use 70% thereabouts. That's what Congressman Issa would always reference. About 70% of it you could agree on, but you couldn't figure out what the hell that 70% was and break that out and like pass bipartisan health care reform. That would be amazing. Um, There's no way to do it. <laughs> Maybe. That, that's, that's in one of the regulations that's coming in later. One more question. Oh, one more question. Could you two? Okay, two. Two more questions. Mm -hmm. Something, on the other hand, you have, I don't know, like hardcore libertarian software engineers who are like, once we have all this open, we can start refactoring the law and like eliminate the IRS and stuff like that. But it's totally unnecessary now that we can see the data. So I'm just kind of curious what the reception has been or what happens when you have people in the same room uh, coming from these you know, different sides of the spectrum. It, it, it's all, all over the place. Um, there's a lot of opposition, as you can imagine. And it's not, uh, there's a little bit of a lack of utility. You know, I don't understand what the heck this does. Um, almost everybody that we encounter, you just show them a web page and type in dog laws on sanfranciscocode.org, get thousands of references or all of the references to those terms versus the LexisNexis where you get you know, a tenth of that versus the city website's PDFs where you get maybe a hundredth of that. They're like, oh God, this is better. Let's do it. Um, there are entrenched people, as, as we all know too well, who are against this just in principle. They don't want to make it easy for you to discover the law. They make a lot of money out of you not discovering the law. Um, we assume the best in all people and all institutions, at least at the outset, until we are proven again and again otherwise. Uh, but there is a lot of that. And so um, that has not stopping us, though. You know, the, I would say we do get feedback, positive and negative, all the time. We do get opposition all the time. Um, but so what? We're doing it anyway. Right on. Locally, appropriate. Um, so I can see uh, so much of the good of, of this, how you know this could stack with the local projects and the state projects you're doing when you're looking at a local code on housing code or something else, and you're also looking at housing incentives that have been mentioned to some other you know, law or something in the state level, federal level, and you know, that the work you're doing could be uh, could expose a lot of insight and intelligence into the process. Or on any of the local. I can see how 
this could become a collaborative document and what you could have it. Although their their code is sort of kind of a cluster cut on it. And it did the same thing about the uh, the Google Docs code. Uh, so that's that count. Um, so then two small questions. First is I spent a lot of time uh, parsing large XML documents for textbook manufacturers. And they are the makers of large XML maybe even the makers of large XML text documents over and above government. Um, and I'm not convinced that XML can ever be disputable. I, I, you know, it's fine. Everyone uses XML. It's what it is. And it's dumb, and you make a layer that's intelligent above it. <clears throat> but I almost wonder if there's something at the nexus between uh, what you're doing, what Google's doing, and what Wolfram Alpha is doing, and the way that data is stored and um, CouchDB comes to mind for these blobs and mm -hmm. just alternatives to XML that could make the way we store the data a little bit more intelligent or at least a little easier. APIs are fine, right? When you make the APIs right. fine, but in the end, the way the data lives at its lowest level can make a difference to how the API is structured and how the program thinks. And I think it's mm -hmm. why textbooks have been stupid for so long and it's why blogs. Absolutely. That, the the follow-up point was yeah. that obviously the end conclusion is we want to Google for Saul's questions. How, how does line item Vito work? We want Wolfram Alpha's new engine to be the answer. It's like, well, obviously it works this way, and here's all the documents, laws, and other things that relate to it that aren't necessarily just the products of law, but are like a larger system of organizing useful data. Mm -hmm. um, you're right, XML is not the answer. Uh, that is very much a middle step or a waypoint. Um, it was uh, the data format when Walla started that was easiest just to get open. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, there's XML and there's JSON going on a little bit here, which is, it's an improvement. Um, there's got to be a better way. Uh, no one has actually done this before, though. No one has sat down and said, gee, we actually have the ability today to have all of the laws in the same data format, all in the same database, what is the ideal way to do that? Um, we would love help from Google. We would love help from Wolfram Alpha, and I don't just mean us, I mean the whole community. That's what they do. Um, they don't do the people side. They don't do the PDF to whatever. Um, they've actually told us, if you find that answer, tell us, we'd love to know. Um, they have their, be you know, in a lot of ways, their best minds are working on rocket ships and Google Glasses and like, you know, talking computers. Like, I don't know what it is. They're not working on this. Um, we would love to get everything to that level. If it's at XML, maybe we can make it attractive and say, gee, we've got, I would say, the most valuable data set in, in the United States here. Can we do something with it? Can we make it better? Um, something to watch over the next year to this point is uh, Waldo Jaquith, again, is setting up. He's stepping away from the state to code it as we're starting to scale it and, and grow it. Um, he's setting up an open data institute in the U.S. This is one of those exact things, uh, questions that hasn't been possible to ask yet, but it is, it's starting to emerge. I mean, uh, I don't know what the answer is, though. I would connect with him and stay in touch. Um, like I said, we got seven. We're going to have another ten or so by, you know, over the next month. That's a lot, that's a big corpus of, of data all in the same format uh, that hasn't been there before. What do you do with it? I don't know. How do we get a new city in, by the way? How do we get a new city in? Wow. Um, we sometimes just do it and go to them and say, hey, look what we did. Uh, sometimes we have like a city of San Francisco who looked at Baltimore. So we were, Baltimore was the first city to, do, to get this done, and we did it in collaboration. We pitched San Francisco months and months and months ago. They were very busy. Um, so Baltimore was first, and then San Francisco called Baltimore and said, that's awesome, how do we do it? And that's another way in. Chicago, we just did it and put it up there and hoped no one yelled at us. Actually, they embraced us. Um, that's not systematic and that's not scalable. Um, that's why we want to get all 15,000, uh, acquire them, I'll leave it at that, and just do it all in one big you know, push or tranche or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that we can build that full library. Um, doing it one by one is 
for us not scalable, but for you guys it is. So Boston isn't done. Massachusetts isn't done. Um, we can help somebody here do that. Cambridge isn't done. Um, but we, you know, we can't do it all ourselves. I wish we could. Anybody have a billion dollars they want to give us so we can wrap it all up? <laughs> um, well, thank you, Laurie. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Um, discussing this is a challenge, as you, you can see, uh, because there are so many moving pieces. And I appreciate you bearing with me and asking good questions uh, to help us get this, this story better. Um, if there's an email list, if you want to get in touch with me or with our developers, come up, grab me. Uh, we're at foundopengov on Twitter. And have a great rest of the day. Thank you.